All right, in this little lecture, we're gonna talk about different agencies. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, which agency is the best? And quite frankly, it's a pretty simple answer. It just sort of depends on what you want to accomplish. So what's the objective of this? Well, the objective is very simple. We wanna better understand your options as a diver and as a dive professional, if that's what you want to become. The value is pretty simple too. Ultimately, it will help you make a more informed decision when you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to accomplish. And that's an important point that we're gonna talk about in a second. You need to know what your goals are in order to truly answer this question properly. Now, when I talk about knowing your goals, the reason I ask that question is because if you want to just become a recreational diver that dives a lot as a hobbyist, it really doesn't matter who you train with. It doesn't matter what agency. Well, it matters what the instructor's competency level is, but not necessarily the agency who actually certifies you and gives you a, a C card. Really, that's irrelevant. If, on the other hand, you want to become a professional, a dive guide, a dive master, or an instructor, really, that's when it starts to become more of an issue, and we're going to have to talk about the differences between the different agencies, what kind of job prospects and that kind of thing are available for you, whether you want to be independent or work with a shop or a school. Just sort of, there's a lot of variables to discuss, but it's not that complex, quite frankly. There's a lot of information out there on the internet, and most of it's nonsense. Just remember that brands are brands. Patty, SSI, NAWI, SEI, CMAS, all the organizations out there, and there are well over a hundred of them worldwide, are really just private companies or nonprofit organizations that are trying to accomplish a specific mission. And many of them work together to ensure that their standards are the same. So for example, ISO, the International Standards Organization, has worked with different agencies and different organizations in different countries to create standards at different levels. So when you look at a C card, for example, it often will say what the ISO certification level is. And that ISO isn't a mandate, it's just basic standards information that everybody agreed upon, and then the agencies incorporate that as their baseline, as the minimum standard that they're gonna certify by. In the United States, the RSTC, the Recreational Scuba Training Council, was established because we're a private group of people that work together. We're non-government. Uh, we're not regulated by the government. We're a private self-regulating industry. And as a consequence, we want to work together to ensure that we have standards that we can agree upon so that government agencies don't get involved and start controlling us. That's really what it's about in the diving industry. So the RSTC is an example of organizations that work together by membership to hash out these different standards and agree on how many dives, for example, that you must do in order to get your open water scuba instructor or your open water uh, dive certification. So let's say that you want to do open water or your advanced or your rescue. What are the basic standards that we're going to agree upon as agencies working together to ensure that we sort of have an interchangeable standard and group of standards or regulations that we can all be happy with in the industry? So ultimately, you just have to figure out what it is that you want to accomplish. If your goal is to become a professional, things get a little bit more difficult. And that's because some of the agencies want to maintain their market control. So for example, Patty may not accept SSI at the open water scuba instructor or higher level. They may require you to do training. Right now, for example, SSI is growing in leaps and bounds. They're a 50 year old company, right? So they were acquired by head and they're growing tremendously in different markets, like for example, the Asian market. And as they grow, there's gonna be more need for instructors. So right now they're allowing instructors from different organizations to cross over quite seamlessly and without a whole lot of difficulty. And that's quite affordable. And that's gonna bolster the ranks of SSI instructors around the world because right now there are more SSI jobs than there are instructors available. The converse is true, for example, with Patty, which is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Patty is the largest organization by far. They're extremely large with a lot of people involved and they have a lot of money and weight behind their marketing program. So everybody knows them because their logo slapped on the side of every wall and dive shop as you walk down the beach in Koh Tao or walk down the beach in Cozumel. It doesn't matter where you go. They've had a 50 year you know, time that they've been able to dedicate to that marketing project and the growth of their brand. And they've done a very, very good job at that. However, because they've done such a very good job at that, there are a lot of professionals under the Patty brand, but there aren't as many jobs. And that's something to consider. If you go to a school and they've only got one job, but there are literally 400 applicants, well, it's a little hard to get that job, isn't it? Because you're competing against people who have all the same credentials. Right now, that's not the case with SSI, but that will change in due course, I'm sure. 
as these brands grow and become more successful, that's the nature of the industry. And it happens in any industry, not just in scuba diving. So again, your goals matter. You need to figure that out. For example, if you're a dive master, you can easily go into a PADI IDC. So if you're an SSI dive master or a NAWI dive master, PADI is going to allow you to go pretty seamlessly run right into an IDC with a course director pretty much anywhere in the world. Now they may tell you that you're not going to be able to do it and that you've got to do retraining, but that's going to be sort of based upon the level of competency you show up with. It's not going to be based upon regulations because right now that's the reality. You can go from dive master and SSI right into a PADI IDC and likewise you can go as a PADI dive master right into an SSI ITC instructor training course. It's pretty much exactly the same. Some agencies have a little bit stricter rules but it just sort of varies and right now SSI and PADI are the ones that are sort of battling for market share at this point. At the lower levels most certifications are interchangeable. In other words if you do nitrox with PADI SSI shops are not going to question any validity on that at all. They'll be perfectly fine with it. If you've done your open water with SSI and you go to a PADI shop, the PADI shop's not going to question it either. So from the certification standpoint, there's really not an issue. They're pretty much interchangeable no matter where you go. And at worst case, the dive shop is going to want to check your skills before they say rent equipment to you or put you out on a boat. Again, there is a little bit of a problem at the higher levels as a professional but it's gonna vary from agency to agency. But don't believe that you're not qualified simply because you're with one agency and not with another. There's a lot of nonsense that goes on between these agencies, or I should say not the agencies themselves because they're actually pretty good about it, but the individuals who are part of the agencies tend to be pretty arrogant and nonsensical about their views. Try to study fallacies of argumentation. There's about 80 plus of them that are worthy of your time and they'll help you understand logic and understand arguments much, much better. And what I would do is I would avoid falling for hyperbole and hype and nonsense and try to do your research and due diligence so you can make an informed decision. By all means, ask us any questions you like in the comment section or reach out to us and ask us directly at divementor.org. We'd be more than happy to give you solid professional advice whether you're training with us or not. As a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization, our focus isn't about putting money in our pocket but about creating better divers and helping the industry move forward in a more progressive and positive way. The difference between academics in the United States and academics in the United Kingdom is quite remarkable. Now I studied at the postgraduate, well, undergraduate and postgraduate level in the United States and in both England and Scotland. And one of the things that I really noticed as I moved into PhD level or postgraduate level was that it was far less about the school and far more about the instructor because as you move into a PhD level, they like to say that you know more and more and more about less and less and less. And so really, the program does matter. I'm not saying that a university doesn't matter. For example, if you went to Oxford or Harvard, these are both very reputable universities with long histories and they're very well recognized around the world. It's not gonna kill you though if you go to Sacramento State University or you go to uh, Dundee University in Scotland. It just varies from program to program, but what I found is that the higher levels, as you become more competent and you want to become more recognized as an academic, it's about finding the right professor who can model for you and mentor you and make sure that they manage your PhD program. Now, that's very different than the way the United States approaches PhDs. In most cases, US PhDs are you know, a five, six year program, maybe a four year program, and it's about the university and then jumping through academic hoops. In other words, you take X amount of credits so that you can satisfy the requirements to earn your PhD. Whereas in the UK, it's about writing a thesis, or I should say probably a dissertation, that generally is 100,000 words or more. And in order to do something like that, to bring something to life that is that unique and provides a whole new contribution to academia in your particular study, makes much more sense to think about the person you're going to be studying with who can guide you and mentor you and help you become more competent. Well, I think that applies to diving in the professional level a lot too. At the lower levels, a, an open water scuba instructor can teach your open water course or your advanced course or do some of your specialties. And you're gonna get pretty much bog standard across the board instructional training from that instructor because they were trained in an instructor development course or instructor training course based on regulations. But as you move up the ladder, as you move more towards instructor courses, open water scuba instructor, 
or an MSDT with Patty, or you want to become an advanced open water scuba instructor with SSI, or an assistant instructor trainer or staff instructor, as you move up the ranks, the people you train under really do matter. The regulations are identical almost across the board. So then it becomes a matter of the competency of the instructor, trainer, or course director who you're working with and whether or not they're going to follow those standards or meet or exceed those standards. I believe in exceeding standards. I think it's critically important that we bring the level higher. So for example, my dive master candidates before they go to an instructor training course have to do an enormous amount of physics, an enormous amount of physiology. They have to take other courses that are not required in the average dive master internship. And the reason we do that is because we want them to be really competent. We don't want to put our names on their certificates unless we know that they can run circles around other dive masters. And I would happily put my dive masters against dive masters from anywhere in the world. That's not me saying that dive masters aren't competent in meeting standards. If they check the box, they check the box. But I believe in doing more than checking the box. And I think it's incumbent upon us at the level I'm at, the instructor trainer level or the course director level, that we push things to progress that we develop these students so that they become the best possible divers that they can possibly be, that they get the best return of investment on their investment so that they're not just spending money just to check a box, and that they learn why they do the things they do, not just know how to do them. And then when they learn how to do them, they do them at a standard that is higher than everybody else. I want my dive master candidates to go to instructor development course, whether it's with Patty, if they leave SSI and go over to another organization because maybe they need to for job prospects or because they're trying to get a specific job. I want them to go into that course and that course director or that instructor trainer to go, wow, you are really competent and they're doing everything at the instructor level. And I think that's very, very important. And I do that with all of our dive master candidates, bar none. And you can contact any of them and ask them directly and they'll tell you the same. And then we also do that with instructors so that when instructors are becoming candidates and going through the process, we want them to go to the IE, the instructor evaluation, and absolutely destroy. We want them to get threes across the board. And when I was teaching Patty IDCs, we wanted them to get fives across the board if at all humanly possible, the highest possible score. So the examiner goes, wow, these are really well-trained candidates. And there's no hesitation about giving them their certification so that they can go out and then teach divers at the open water, advanced and so forth levels.